While the disciples quarrel over which one of them is the greatest, Jesus tells them that the way to be great is to serve. Then, to make it concrete, he puts in front of them a flesh and blood child. We are called to welcome the children of God puts in front of us, to make room for them in daily interaction, and to give them a place of honor in the assembly. Hello and welcome to Peace Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Ronnie. So glad that you could join us here on this Sunday, September the 19th. I hope that you find your time nourishing and life-giving. Really mean a lot to us if you could like this video and subscribe to this channel and helps us to spread our message to more and more people. Without further ado, let us prepare our hearts for worship. And we begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our Comforter, like lost sheep we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help, and lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Let us now pray together the prayer of the day. O God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi everyone! I hope you all had an amazing week. How was your week, Tina? It was great. How was your week? It was good too. Besides school, many extracurricular activities started last week too, so I needed to get a little bit more better adjusted to my new schedule. Many of you might be facing similar things. It's not easy and it'll take time to get adjusted to new things. Today, we'll talk about how Moses had to face a new challenge. But first, let's review Moses' story so far. What do you remember, Tina? Well, last week we heard about the story of Moses when he was a baby. A new Egyptian king hated the Israelites and he was so mean to them. He made them into slaves and even killed all the Israelites' baby boys. Moses was one of the Israelite baby boys, but God was with him, protected him, and took care of him. Moses was picked up by the king's daughter and nursed by his own mom. I like this part of the story about how Moses' mom actually got to nurse and raise him. That's right. God was always with Moses and he protected him and took care of him. That's how God is with us too. He is always with us, protects us, and takes care of us. Now, let's hear about what happened when Moses got a little bit older. Here we go. Moses was brought up as an Egyptian prince, but he knew that he was an Israelite by birth. As he was growing up, the rest of the Israelites who lived in Egypt continued to be slaves, and they were treated very badly. One day, when he was a young man, he saw an Egyptian guard beating up an Israelite man. Something snapped in him, and he beat up the guard and ended up killing him. Oh, no! What have I done? Even my mother, the princess, would not be able to save me from this punishment. So Moses fled to a country called Midian. Now, there was a priest in Midian named Jethro, and he has seven daughters. One day, they came to the well to draw water and fill a bucket to water their father's flock. Some mean shepherds came along and tried to drive them away, but Moses was nearby, so he came to their rescue and watered the flock. When the girls got home, Jethro asked them, 
Why have you returned so early today? They answered. An Egyptian rescued us from the mean shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. So they did. Moses stayed with them for a while, and later he got married to one of Jethro's daughters, Zipporah. During that long period, the mean Pharaoh died. Egypt had a new king, but the Israelites' misery did not stop. One day, Moses was out with his sheep when he came upon a very strange sight. A bush was on fire, but the leaves and branches of the bush weren't burning away. He thought, Hmm, I'm gonna go over and see this strange sight. I'll find out why the bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw that Moses had come over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses! Moses! Moses answered, Here I am, Lord. God said, Do not come any closer and take off your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. God continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses fell to the ground, covering his face in terror. God continued, I have seen the misery of my people, the Israelites, in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out. I am very concerned for them, so I am going to free them from slavery and return them to Canaan, the land where I promised them for them. I want you to go back to Egypt and rescue my people. Convince them to follow you and demand Pharaoh to release them. Moses was shocked. He said, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I am afraid. God said to Moses, I will be with you. But Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They'll probably ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God answered, I am who I am. This is what you say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Moses asked again, What if they do don't believe me or listen to me. God said, Let me give you some signs then. What is it that you have in your hand? Do you mean the staff? Moses replied. Then the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. What the heck was that? Then the Lord said, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Seriously? Um, okay. Here I go. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Whoa! This is so cool! God said, This is so that they may believe that the Lord... The God of their fathers has appeared to you. Likewise, God gave Moses two more miraculous signs so that the Israelite people would believe him. The second sign was that if Moses thrust his hand into his robe, it came out covered with scales and sores of diseased leprosy. But when he put it back in again, it was healed and healthy. And the third sign was that if Moses poured some water from the river Nile onto the ground, it would turn into blood. Moses was stunned and he was amazed, but he was still a bit unsure. He said to God, Oh, the signs are great, but how could I be a leader? I'm so bad at talking in public. I go so red like a tomato when I talk in front of many people. Isn't there someone else that you can send? Then God said to Moses, Your brother Aaron can speak well. 
He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You can speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. Make sure that you take this staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. God spoke to Moses. You know what? Maybe not through a burning bush, but he speaks to us too. And we can always talk to God through our prayers. He is listening to us. Prayer is a conversation with God. So technically there aren't really any rules, but uh, if you ever need to write a prayer for a youth group or a confirmation class or anything at church, here is a good tip. There may be many, many different ways, but if we can remember to include these four very important things that I'm about to tell you about, we should be good. We're going to use a method called the ACTS method. You know how to spell ACTS, right? Yeah, A-C-T-S. That's right. So A is for adoration. See, we want to start a conversation by addressing God. We want to give God praise and we want to give Him honor. Every Sunday during our church service, we hear Pastor Ronnie pray and he uses phrases like Dear Jesus, Gracious God, or Heavenly Father, and so on. What's the next letter? C. C is for confession. This one can be a little bit difficult, but basically it means that we want to honestly admit and deal with our sins. Next, T. T is for thanksgiving. Here, we want to say out loud what we're thankful for. And the last letter? S. Yeah, S is for supplication. Supplication is an interesting sounding word, isn't it? We don't really use it in our day-to-day -day life, but basically it means to pray for the needs of ourselves and also for the needs of others. So Tina, let's follow this method and try to write a prayer. Okay, so we'll start with A for adoration, right? Yep. So how about Dear Jesus? Yeah, okay. that sounds good. Go on. Say okay. for confession. Um, so any kind of sin, right? Any kind of sin. Um, how about I'm sorry that I procrastinate sometimes, like when I'm reminded that I need to be doing something, but I'm watching like a video on YouTube and I say, oh, it's just one more minute. And then I keep going on afterwards yeah well that happens let me see for me well okay so last year during my online school time there were a couple of times that i slept in and woke up late and i had to join class late and instead of telling my teacher that i overslept and that i was irresponsible i blamed it on the internet connection so i wouldn't get in trouble anyways god already knows everything the things we have done and things that we haven't done. But when, whenever we make mistakes, it's important to acknowledge it and say we are sorry. Next is T for Thanksgiving. That's right. So I've got a lot of these. I'm thankful for my family, my friends, my church, my school, music, beautiful weather, and a time together to make this video. Yeah, that's so sweet. You are so right. We have so much to be thankful for. Everything that we have and everything we see is a gift from God. And finally, supplication. Do you remember what this word means? Yeah, it's like praying for other people and ourselves, right? Exactly. Okay, then I pray for those who are sick and for those who are taking care of the sick, like doctors and nurses. Good. I pray for teachers at my school. I also pray for students, especially university students, like our big sister Ellie, who is living away from home. Oh, I pray for Pastor Ronnie. He's taking good care of all of us in church, so I pray that he doesn't get too tired. Me too. That's a good thing to pray for. Remember that God is always with us and always listening to us. He is also always speaking to us through our parents' words, through our pastors and teachers, through church friends, through pastor's messages, and through the Bible. We can always talk to him, and we can always use the Acts method. Let's pray. Dear God, 
Thank you for always being there for us and always listening to us. We know that we can always talk to you through our prayers. Sometimes we need to listen to you better. Please help us to listen to you. Amen. Psalm 54, God is my helper. It is the Lord who sustains my life. Save me, O God, by your name. In your might, defend my cause. Hear my prayer. O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, and the ruthless have sought my life. Those who have no regard for God, behold, God is my helper. It is the Lord who sustains my life. Render evil to those who spy on me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will offer you a free will sacrifice and praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from every trouble, and my eyes look down on my enemies. Today's Gospel is from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. Jesus' teaching and action in this text are directed to the church whenever it is seduced by the world's definition of greatness, prestige, power, influence, and money. The antidote to such a concern for greatness is servanthood. Jesus and his disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all the servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, 
Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Greetings, people of peace. We continue to follow Jesus and his disciples through the Gospel of Mark. And more than any other gospel, Mark emphasizes Jesus' humanity. Being human myself, I often feel like I can relate to this human Jesus. I get tired and I get hungry too. And like the disciples, I sometimes misunderstand what is happening around me. And what seems clear to God doesn't always seem clear to me. The historian in me appreciates that this gospel is the closest of the four to the events of Jesus' life by several decades. And you can feel it when you read it. There is an intimacy and immediacy to Mark's reporting. He does not try to fill in a lot of details, reporting on events in a very simple manner and employing an impressive economy of words. And indeed, there are no words ever wasted. It is so well written. Last week, we heard Jesus preach for the first time about how the Messiah was to be treated. We witnessed the confusion and fear of the disciples when they heard this terrible news. And Mark writes in a way where we almost feel like we're in the scene with them. Now this week we hear the same refrain. Jesus taught them that the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed he will rise again. The disciples didn't even ask Jesus about it because they were so afraid. And we can feel their fear. Last week we tried to empathize with Peter, and we talked about how gritty these stories could be and how difficult it is to follow Jesus. You'll remember he said, If any want to be my disciples, deny yourselves, pick up your cross, and follow me. We talked about how challenging discipleship can be, even if we engage the gospel with gratitude, good cheer, and high spirits, Jesus calls us into places that will make us uncomfortable. And speaking of being uncomfortable, a few weeks ago I preached on atonement, or rather against atonement. Generally speaking, the doctrine of atonement puts forward the idea that God sacrificed God on the cross to satisfy God. It holds then that Jesus died for our sins. It is well established throughout Scripture that God despises our blood sacrifices, and yet that's what we've done with Jesus. We've made him the ultimate sacrifice, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, the Lamb of God. You'll remember a few months back when we read Mark 3, Jesus was accused of having an unclean spirit, and he preached about how a house divided against itself cannot stand. How then can God sacrifice God on the cross to satisfy God? This would amount to a house divided against itself. It is very hard for me to speak on this topic because I know it goes against the traditional teachings of the church a tradition that many of us hold dear. And I happen to really love some versions of Lamb of God that we would typically find in our liturgy. Mark, however, makes no mention of atonement theology. In fact, Mark consistently contradicts atonement theology. Jesus was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him and three days after being killed, he will rise again. Notice here that it says betrayed into human hands. It doesn't say that God betrayed him or that God demanded his sacrifice for human sin for all time. He said he would be betrayed into human hands. He will be betrayed into hands that look a lot like our hands. It was human hands that arrested him human hands that tortured him, human hands that crucified him. Human hearts rejected his teachings, rejected the indwelling God of Christ, the healings, the miracles. And we know the names of the humans that these hands and hearts belong to. Judas, Caiaphas, Annas, 
Pontius Pilate and Herod, probably the greatest villains of all time. And as hard as I try to rationalize it, I cannot see God acting through these characters. Rather, I see God acting despite these characters. Neither can I justify their deeds to satisfy my own salvation. It is only the saving grace of God that overcomes this human folly and redeems Christ through the cross, in the grave, on the road ahead of us to Galilee, and through the Holy Spirit. Atonement theology proposes that Jesus died for our sins, but it seems more likely, at least through Mark's lens, that Jesus died because of our sins. You'll remember in Mark 3, after the house divided itself against itself teaching, Jesus declared that our sins were already forgiven before they even happened. In verse 28, he told the crowd, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said that he had an unclean spirit. It holds then that the crucifixion was not a prerequisite to becoming reconciled with God. We achieve reconciliation through repentance and forgiveness rather than a sacrifice. Both Jesus and John the Baptist were very strong on this point. Repentance and forgiveness is our greatest spiritual tool to achieve the loftiest spiritual goal, to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. You may remember back in January when we first started reading Mark again this year, when we heard the very first teaching Jesus had in Mark's gospel, when he was recruiting disciples along the Sea of Galilee. He proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven had come close Repent and believe the good news. The shocking good news is that God is so close, we can't even comprehend it. God dwells inside of all living things. And this, to me, is the great revelation of Jesus, that God is not some distant external thing, locked in a temple, separate, separated from us. God is lovingly woven through every fiber of our being. There can be no separation from God. God is with us always, to the end of the age and beyond. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Peace be with you all. Do you walk, run, or bike for fun and exercise? These activities are becoming more and more popular these days. Would it still be fun if it was the only way to get around? During my early high school days, back in Guyana, where I grew up, I did a lot of walking and riding. Before I had a bike, if I didn't have money for the school bus, I would walk to school three miles each way. It was kind of fun at that age, one hour to get to school and of course two hours to get home, lots of distractions. Time seems to go more slowly in that part of the world. In Jesus' time, it might have been the same. People walked everywhere, wherever they had to go. There was no public transportation. Maybe it was possible to hitch a ride on an ox cart, which might have been slower than walking anyway. So I think most people ended up walking to wherever they had to go. The more fortunate could have had horses or slaves to carry them around. Donkeys were also very popular, but only for those who could afford it. Jesus and his disciples didn't seem to be able to afford donkeys, so they walked everywhere. In the text from Mark chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples are returning home to Capernaum after a long journey visiting the cities around Galilee. They had gone to the Mediterranean coast, to Tyre and Sidon, to Capolis, the group of ten cities, and far north to Caesarea Philippi, and most likely many places in between. That was a lot of walking, maybe hundreds of miles. We heard that Jesus had become known in these places also, and that he preached and healed as he went on his journey. I can't imagine how long it would have taken them to complete their trip. It could have been weeks or months. On their return through Galilee, Jesus needed some quiet time alone with his disciples. He had important things to teach them and didn't want any distractions. I wonder how they managed to avoid the crowds on that last leg of their journey. For the second time, Jesus tells the disciples of his impending death and resurrection, and also that he would be betrayed. Mark said they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Is it surprising that they didn't understand? I don't think so. Jesus was not the easiest person to understand then and even now. He still struggled to find the right meaning of everything that he said. I think if we were in their shoes or sandals, we would not understand either. The first time that Jesus told them about what was to happen to him, they couldn't understand nor accept that their master, their leader, their Messiah, would have to be brought so low, humiliated, and killed. If that happened, what would become of the movement they had started? What would become of them without the leader? Also, Jesus had practically told them that their heads were in the wrong place, that their thinking was wrong, that after all the time that they had spent together, they still were not thinking on a spiritual level. Is that why they were afraid to ask him anything the second time? It sounds like a good reason. And they probably decided to take him at his word. After all, he was their teacher, and he knew what he was talking about. As they walked to their house in Capernaum, we are told that they were arguing among themselves. We are told that they were arguing about who was the greatest among them. Well, the only one I know who actually made that claim publicly was Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. But let's pause for a moment and ask, why were they arguing about that in the first place? Some information seems to be missing here, and I understand that this is normal for Mark to do in his gospel. Consider the possibility 
that the disciples had accepted that they would be losing their leader and that they would have to select a new leader from among themselves when he was gone. This would give them reason to be arguing about who of them was the greatest. Also, Jesus had selected three of what must have been his most trusted disciples and taken them up to the mountain to witness his transfiguration. They were Peter, James, and John. And as we can see in Acts and other New Testament books, they actually become the leaders of the new church. Even their fellow disciples would have recognized that those three would be in the race for leadership. Of course, Jesus already knew what was going on. And when they got to the house in Capernaum, he asked them anyway what it was they were arguing about. Like little school kids being questioned by the teacher for disrupting the class, none of the disciples answered Jesus. Imagine the tension in the room at that moment. Everyone is tired from their journey, including Jesus, and no one is owning up to what they did. This time, Jesus handles the situation with the truth and gentleness of the true master that he is. It says in verse 35, he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Imagine yourself being there among the twelve and hearing those words from Jesus. You would know right away that Jesus knew everything that happened and nothing could be hidden from him. I personally would be truly embarrassed. But it was not Jesus' intention to embarrass anyone. Not then and not now. This is a good example for us to know that he is always listening to us. Wherever we are and wherever, whatever we are doing, and he will correct us with love and gentleness while teaching us the right way. And that is what he did for his disciples that day. Also take note that he didn't condemn them for what they were arguing about. Instead, he offered them advice on how they should be thinking about it. This rule that Jesus laid down on that day should be the motto of all leaders. One young king asked his mentor, Do all these people belong to me? And the wise mentor answered, No. You belong to all of them. In order to lead, you need to know the people that you are leading. And in order to know the people you are leading, you need to be at their level. You need to understand their situation, their problems, their ideas, and their aspirations. Leaders who do not do this are leaders without followers. I've had a few managers in my time and only a very small number of them showed signs of being the kind of leader that Jesus describes. Those few are the ones that came down to the factory floor and had genuine conversations with the workers, listening to their problems and concerns and actually doing something about it. However, this is not just a lesson in leadership. It's a lesson for all of us to learn about life and how we treat others. If we ever feel that we are above anyone else because of who or what we think we are, we are not doing what Jesus said. If you ask someone who they are, they would usually give their name and to qualify who they really think they are, they will tell you their profession. That may be all well and good if you are going for an interview. But take that all away, and what do we have left? Who are we really? We are servants, serving in the kingdom of God. Therefore, we have to remove our crowns, our badges, and our self-made labels, and put on our servers' aprons, serving others as we have been asked to do by our Lord. In my mind, my dad, was a shining example of the life of a servant of Christ. 
He was a lay pastor or catechist, as they were called back then, in charge of a congregation in the countryside, one of several that he helped to build himself. He spent much of his free time visiting with his members, helping them and counseling them. Sometimes the problems were domestic, always an iffy situation, especially if alcohol is involved. Most nights he would get home after dark, and we knew when he was approaching because we could hear his Royal Enfield motorcycle a mile away. He lived the life of the servant, but his reward came too soon. I was only seven. I have known many dedicated servants of our Lord, my mother included. Our own congregation is overflowing with them, from the young to the old. There's no qualifications required to be a servant. Every little thing that we do for someone else shows that we are servants of the Lord. Right now we are going through a difficult time with COVID, which restricts us from doing many things. But just keeping in touch, a phone call, an email, a card, supporting the pastor during this very difficult time, bringing your skills into play in so many different ways. And I can go on and on, but you get the picture. Jesus said that he came to serve, not to be served. And he gave a good demonstration of this at the Last Supper, when he got on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. Once again, Peter objected to Jesus, his Lord and Master, stooping so low to the level of a servant by washing his feet. But Jesus had to remind him again that if he did not allow Jesus to serve him, Peter would not be a part of him. Jesus set the example for us to follow by living his life in ministry for others. The Prince of Peace, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, born of poor parents in a lowly manger, never elevated himself to that status. I am not suggesting that anyone go out washing other people's feet, unless that is something you want to do. We are, we are being servants of the Lord when we demonstrate the love of Christ in any way we can. In John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus said, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. In verse 36 and 37 of our text, Jesus goes even further in his explanation of what it means to be a servant. Then he took a, a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. Jesus uses a child to show how low we must go to be a servant. That doesn't sound like a nice thing to say about a child, but apparently that's how it was back then. In those days, children were on the lowest level of the scale and the hierarchy of respect in the family. For someone to respect a child and welcome him or her, that person would have to put aside their pride and status and stoop to a level even lower than that of a child. And Jesus said, if we can do that for a child, for a child, we are doing it for him. And not only for him, but for God also. In today's world, we would like to think that the children have been moved to a higher level on the scale. And they have, and they have in our minds and in our homes, in our families. As far as God is concerned, the children are at the top of his scale. And we are there also if we can be like them. But as we look around, even in our own backyard, we can see where the status of, status of children did not change, and we need to do a lot of work to make it right. We thank God for all his faithful servants, 
who are out there in all parts of the world, sharing the love of Christ with his children. We pray, Lord, that we will all be inspired by your word to be the servants you want us to be. Amen. Yep. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you bring your people together in worship and live in your church. Guide all evangelists, preachers, prophets, and missionaries who seek to share your love through word and deed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You provide water for thirsty ground and sunshine to feed hungry plants. Bless all who advocate for healthy forests, unpolluted air and clean waterways. Inspire all people to show care for the world you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show no partiality. Increase justice in all nations. Encourage leaders and government to work with one another for the good of our common world. Unite us in seeking the health, safety, and dignity of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You accompany those who are most in need, shelter all fleeing violence or persecution, protect any who are in danger, and sustain them through uncertain and unstable times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You support the work of your dis disciples. Continue to nurture the leadership and ministries of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You embrace all who have died in the faith and brought them into your glorious presence. We thank you for the example and rejoice in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in your hearts known only to you, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray as Jesus has taught us in whichever language or variation you're most comfortable with. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us now join in confessing the faith of the Church. We believe in God the Creator, Maker of everything, Author of the universe, and mystery behind every matter. We believe in Jesus Christ, God from God, light from light, true God and true human, one with the Creator. He is the Word made flesh and the Savior of all creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, breath of God moving among us, one with the Creator and one with Christ, our guide and the mentor of all creation. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's blessing. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
Yeah.